All right, well, um, yeah, so it's a little, something a little different. Mind expanding is a good word for it. Um, so the title of my talk is Computing Like the Brain. Uh, about 30 years ago, when I was a young man, I fell in love with brains. And uh, I was inspired by an article by Francis Crick, who, uh, who, of DNA fame, who wrote an article in a, in a single issue topic, a single topic issue in Science of American about the brain. And he said, he said, look, we have all this data about the brain, all these facts and knowledge, but we have no idea how it works. And he says, what we're missing is some sort of broad framework of ideas in which to interpret neuroscience results. And we basically was a, a data rich and theory poor field. And I said, boy, working on brains and figuring out how brains work would be the greatest thing to do. What an important thing. What an exciting thing. And I dedicated my life to it. And um, it was very difficult to do. And um, so I had a, a few stints in the mid 80s where I was a graduate student working full time for a few years. But it was very hard to, to get, get a gig working full time doing neuroscience theory. Um, so actually, I ended up started Palm and Handspring for a few years, and well, 15 years. Um, and now, for the last 10 years, or almost 11 years now, I've been doing it full time. First at the Redwood Neuroscience Institute, uh, which is now at Berkeley. I ran that for several years, and now at Numenta. So uh, I'm going to tell you about what we've been doing and the exciting progress we've been making. Um, I started um, out 30 years ago. Gave myself two tasks. First was to answer Francis Crick's call, which was to discover the principles of uh, the operation of the neocortex. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the neocortex today, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But this, uh, this idea that we could figure out how the brain works, the information principles by which, by which it works, uh, a lot of people thought that was crazy back then. Some people still do, but not too many. Um, and then I figured, as soon as you figure how this works, you could build machines that work on those principles. And that was exciting, too, because I realized we could build machines that are faster and more intelligent and bigger and all kinds of cool things. Uh, than humans are, and so, boy, this would be a great thing to do. So the basic process is the following. You start with, um, with uh, anatomy and physiology of the brain, because the brain provides a, a whole set of constraints, and there's a ton of stuff that's known about the brain. It's hard to imagine how many papers are published every year and how much data we have that's been unassimilated by theory. So we have this, all this detail about anatomy and physiology, and those are constraints on what the theoretical principles are going to work with. You have to start there. Uh, then you can decide, you can, you can add a little bit of math, a little bit of information theory, and you come up with these principles. And once you can do that, then you can implement them. Uh, and you can start with software, so you can model the principles in software. Um, and that's where we are today. We're starting to do that, and I'm going to demonstrate some of that today. Um, ultimately, uh, this is going to go into other implementations, such as silicon. And there's some fellow conversations that are going on right now between myself and Numenta and some other companies along those lines. So here's the agenda for my talk. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brain. I'm going to describe uh, the, the neocortex as a predictive modeling system. I'm going to talk about three of the principles that are, that are used in it, um, sparse distributed representation, sequence memory, and online learning. I'm then going to briefly introduce a, a product called Grok, which implements this. It's a predictive modeling product. And then I'm going to uh, speculate a little bit about the future of intelligent machines. OK, so let's just jump uh, right into it here. Um, so the neocortex, just, just to make sure you understand, that, you know, if you took a brain, a human brain, the big wrinkly thing on top is the neocortex. It's about 60% uh, of the volume of your brain, and it's where all high-level intelligence resides. So my, my speech is being generated by my neocortex. Your understanding my speech is being interpreted by your neocortex. All vision, all high-level uh, auditory, motor planning, and so on. There's a lot of other stuff the brain does, but the neocortex is where uh, really intelligence resides. And you can think about the neocortex, but you have, to, you have to think about it in terms of the senses. You know, we have a lot of senses, not just the five we think about. The three major ones, vision, touch, and hearing, are actually multiple senses. But the thing you need to understand about them is they're not single senses. The retina is an array of senses. It's actually a million senses. Um, is, there's a million fibers or you know, neurons that are projected from your optic, uh, on your optic nerve. And so it's an, it's an array of a million sensors. The auditory uh, 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 nerve is 30,000, and the somatic uh, senses uh, are about another million. And they're arrays. So the brain has several million senses, actually. And the data changing on them is changed on the order of a few milliseconds, tens of milliseconds, or hundreds of milliseconds. And so you have this fire hose of data coming into the brain the entire waking life. Um, and that's all that the brain has to work with. Um, and what it does is it builds a model of the world. Uh, when you're born, your, your neocortex has structure, but it doesn't know anything. It doesn't know about opera houses. It doesn't know about Alex Miller. It doesn't know about computers. It doesn't know about coffee cups. It doesn't know about streetcars. It doesn't know about anything. It doesn't know a language. It doesn't know math. 
doesn't know any computer languages. You have to learn all that stuff, and it has to be learned through your senses. And so the, the brain builds a model of the world, of what's in the world and how they relate to it. And it's obviously a very sophisticated model, and it has a tremendous capacity. The number of things you know is really amazing. Oh, you're not even aware of most of it. Uh, most of it's subconscious. This model that the brain does then, when you, when you have new sensory input, it invokes the model. That's when you perceive this stage and perceive me talking, you're mostly invoking a model you already have. So sort of a partial, this data comes in and invokes a model. And from that model, you can think of doing three basic things. It makes predictions about what's going to happen next, um, detects anomalies, and generates behaviors. The predictions you're not generally aware of, but your brain is constantly predicting what you're going to see, feel, and touch, or hear. Uh, so if I put my hand on this lectern, I've never stood in this place before, my brain has expectation of what it's going to feel like. If it felt metal or cold or like liquid, I would be very surprised. If I fit my, my hand passed through it, I'd be surprised. So every touch, everything you're doing, every word I say, your brain has expectations about what's going to be, what it's going to see at. It's making predictions constantly. And when those predictions are violated, it detects something's wrong, it's an anomaly. And finally, it generates actions. Uh, every part of the neocortex is generating actions like my speech right now. So we want to understand how this thing works. Uh, and it's a memory system. So unlike my title of my talk, I say computing like the brain, the brain doesn't compute. It's a memory system. It's a very unusual memory system. And so we're going to talk about how that works. Here's the, I'm going to tell you the top three. There's, there's set many principles I can tell you about. I'm going to give you the top three principles that um, I think of when I think about how the neocortex works. The first of all, it's a hierarchy. So even though it's a sheet of cells, um, the different parts of that sheet are different regions. They seem to do different things, but they're connected physically as a hierarchical system. And I've drawn a little caricature drawing of it here. Um, and so you have these regions that project to regions, project to regions. So inputs come from your senses. They converge on the set, first set of regions, and then they, con they converge and converge and up, up the hierarchy. Information flows back down the hierarchy, diverging as it goes back down, too. Now, the amazing thing about this hierarchy is that in the, your neocortex is that all the regions in the neocortex appear to be doing the same thing. So the different regions in the hierarchy, the different sensory modalities are all the same thing. It's, there's one memory algorithm that works on vision, hearing, touch, um, and all the, you know, all the senses that come into the brain. And so we have a hierarchy of similar uh, um, uh, memory uh, regions, and we want to understand how the hierarchy works. Um, the next thing is, uh, what's going on in each of those regions? Well, this is memory, as I mentioned. Uh, the primary memory, not the only type of memory, but the primary memory is sequence memory. This may not be obvious to you. It wasn't obvious to me for many years. Um, but you basically, the, the way you build a model of the world is by view, hear, getting patterns through time. So obviously, my, my neocortex is generating my speech right now. And it's, it's passing to the muscles in my voice box very complex temporal patterns. It's playing back patterns that it's stored before. I've said these words before, maybe not in this exact order. Um, and you are interpreting these things in time. So the only way you can understand my speech is you have to have a memory of what words and phrases and concepts sound in sequence in time. And the order and the timing is very important. And you have to have, you have, to have sequence memory to do this. Well, it turns out that's even how vision works and so on. It, it's all sequence memory, and we want to understand how that works. And the third major principle I'm going to talk about today is the type of representations used in the brain. Um, and these we call sparse distributed representations. Uh, they're sparse because if you look in the brain, everywhere you look, you see a, a bunch of cells, many, many cells. There's about 30 billion cells in your neo neocortex. At any point in time, a very small subset are active, just a few percent. And so it's a sparse representation. And it turns out this is essential to the way the whole thing works. Um, it's even sparse coming off your senses. So when you look at the activation on your auditory nerve or your, or your uh, uh, optic nerve, um, it's a sparse activation there. So it's sparse activations between, and the memory itself is of sparse activations. And that's something we're going to really need to dig into uh, in this talk. So in this talk, I'm not going to talk more about hierarchy. I'm going to talk mostly about some uh, big uh, advances we made three years ago. Um, and that has to do with the sequence memory and sparse distributed representations. So instead of looking at the entire neocortex and the whole hierarchy, we're just going to look at one little small section and sort of uh, uh, figure out what, how is that dealing with sparse distributed representations and how is that learning sequences. All right. So we're going to jump right into it, into sparse distributed representations. So what is a sparse distributed re representation? You can compare it to what we use typically in computers, which are sometimes called dense representations. So let's start with what we do in computers. A dense representation is uh, we typically use 8 or 64 bits, something like that. It's dense because we use all combinations of ones and zeros. So ASCII is a perfect example of this. It's 8-bit code. 
Uh, all combinations of ones and zeros are valid, um, from all zeros to all ones and anything in between. Uh, the individual bits in an ASCII code don't really mean anything. So if I ask you, what is the, what's the meaning of the third bit in an ASCII code? It doesn't really mean much. Um, you might be able to come up with something, but it really has no uh, inherent meaning. And the other thing is that the, the codes we use in computers are somewhat arbitrary. They're assigned by us, the programmers, um, and they, they don't have no inherent meaning in the hardware itself. That is, you can put, you know, you can come up with a different code for, you know, Unicode or whatever you want for encoding things, and, and it's up to us to decide that, and the computer doesn't really know anything about it. When you get to brains and sparse distributed representations, we can look at it this way. You, uh, sparse distributed representations, or SDRs, um, have thousands of bits, at minimum. Um, and they're sparse because at any point in time, only a few are active. So typically in our work, we use 2% activation. So we have, uh, if in our typical example for us, we'll have 2,000 bits. It's kind of about the small side of things. And we'll have 2% of those bits active, so we'll have 41s and 1,960 zeros. And we're always going to be sparse. We're always going to be like that. You'll never have a lot of bits active at once. Now, these are big, big numbers, of course, um, big vectors. But you can, of course, represent a lot of things by choosing 40 out of, of 2,000. Um, now, the difference here is that each bit has some meaning. Each bit can, it actually has its own independent semantic meaning. Uh, these are learned. These are not assigned. They're learned. Um, but when I want to represent something in the brain, the brain does it by picking the, the top best matches, if you will. Let me give you a, an analogy. We wouldn't do it this way, but let me just give you an analogy. If I wanted to represent uh, the letters of the alphabet, in a sparse distributed representation, I might have bits that represent is this a vowel or a consonant. I might have bits that say, is, what does it sound like? Is it a closed sound, open sound, or a hard sound, or a fricative sound? Um, is it O sound or E sound? I might have bits that represent how you draw it. Is it a closed shape, an open shape, straight lines, curved lines? Does it have ascenders and descenders, and so on? And I come up with a whole set of bits that represent things, and then I would pick the top bits that represent this thing, and that's my encoding, my sparse distributed encoding. So each bit has some sort of meaning, and the, and the, and the meaning of the objects themselves is encoded in the representation. Now, we're not going to do it that way. This is all learned, but that gives you a sense for it. Now, sparse distributed representations have some very useful properties, very interesting properties, so we need to go through those. Um, the first one, you can just think of it this way. If I have two SDRs, two sparse distributed representations, and I can, I can compare them, and, I, and if they have, bit, they have the ones in the same locations, that is, the, uh, in a brain, of course, we're talking about cells, but I'm just talking about them as if they're bits, okay? Um, and if they have the sim a common one bits, that means they have a common, they share some semantic properties. So if I see two sparse distributed representations which share some bits, I know immediately they have semantic similarity. This is, uh, because it's very sparse, is unlikely to happen by chance. The next thing is I say, what if I wanted to store a sparse distributed representation? One, I have a, an activation, I want to store it and see if it occurs again. We do this, the brain has to do this all the time. Well, you don't save all 2,000 bits and stick them in some place. You just have to save indexes to the ones. And if, so in this case, if I had 41 bits, I would have 40 index in, into the thing. And I say, now if a new representation comes along, I go down my list of indices, and if I find ones there, then I know I've got a match. Um, but what if I told you you can't store all of them? You can, I, I'm not going to let you store indices to all the bits, but only some subset of the bits. So let's say I say they can only store indices to 10 of the bits. So um, you say, well, I say, will that work or not? And you say, well, no, it could, it could lead to an error because I could, I, could, I could see those 10 bits, but the other 30 could be wrong. And I would be mistaken and say this is the same, same pattern I had before. Uh, Mathematic is very easy to show this is very unlikely that you're going to have an error. Um, it's almost guaranteed you're going to find the right thing. And if you do have an error, it will be one of semantic similarity. You'll be mistaking the input for something that was semantically similar to it um, in a previous time. And so it's not such a bad error if you do that. So the brain does this a lot, and we're going to take advantage of this too. This idea of subsampling. We don't need to save, if we want to recognize these very long bit streams, you only have to save 10, 20 of, of uh, the bits to know where they are and check to see if they exist again. And the third property is one of union. Um, just imagine I gave you 10 of these sparse distributed representations and I ordered them together. So now I still have 2,000 bits, but instead of 2% of the bits being on, I have about 20%, maybe a little bit less. And so I have this union here. Now I give you a new unknown one, and I want to know, is it one of the original 10? Is it a member of the, of the set that we formed the union from? And, um, and what we're going to say is that if I find ones in the unknown, <clears throat> which is only 2% uh, uh, of the bits active, if I find corresponding ones in the, in the union, I'm going to say it was a member. 
Now you again might say, well that could be an error. I could be matching up a one from one of the uh, ten, and another one from another one of the ten, another one from the other ten, and so on. But it turns out mathematically it's very, very unlikely. We're talking astronomically unlikely. Um, and so if you see this kind of match, you say, yeah, it's in the original membership. Now why would I want to do this? Uh, you'll see in a moment. When the brain makes a prediction, it doesn't predict one thing. It actually predicts a whole bunch of things at the same time, often. Sometimes it predicts one thing. Sometimes you know what word is going to be at the end of the sentence, and sometimes you don't. Um, but, but the point is, it makes most of the time you're predicting multiple things at the same time, and we want to know if what happens is one of those things. So I can't tell you all the things I'm predicting. I can't, un I can't unravel that union, but I can tell you if something did happen it was unexpected. And that's what this is used for. OK, now if you're tired, you were up late last night doing some coding, whatever, and you, you're, getting, you're, you're dozing off, you can stop right now because the one thing I want you to walk away from this talk, if, you, if there's only going to be one thing, is that intelligent machines and the brain, but intelligent machines are going to be built on sparse distributed representations. This, I'm certain of this is the key to, to machine intelligence. And uh, now we're going to talk about some of the ways you work on them. OK, I'm now going to talk about sequence memory. How do you uh, learn the sequences of these things? And, and uh, again, this is the key memory operation that's going on in the brain. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of neuroscience just to get you up to where we have to go to, to explain how this works. So if I look at the neocortex, and I just zoomed in on one little section of the neocortex, so the thin sheet of cells, here's a little picture of, of one little uh, section of a neocortex. And, as these, and you can see in there, there's this layer architecture going left and right. And there's sort of, you can see these little vertical lines going. There's a columnar and a layer architecture of this. We're going to zoom in on one of the layers of the cells in here. These layers are all doing similar things. And this is my little caricature drawing of a layer, a small layer of cells in your cortex. The little circles are, are neurons. And um, you can see there's two basic orientations here. The green arrow shows a column of these cells. And what we find in the brain is that, and this is a very narrow column, these are like 30 microns wide. You find these cells that are in this skinny little column, they all have the sort of same response property to input. So you give an input and they, all these cells respond in the same feed forward way. They all have a similar feed forward response property. However, 95% of the connections between cells are horizontal. That's represented by the yellow line. So we have not, the vast majority of the connections are across these columns. Um, and, but we have this very strong vertical orientation. So that's what the cells are connected like. If I zoom in and look at one of those cells, then you can see a picture. This is a picture of a pyramidal cell in the brain. Uh, this is a classic neuron in your neocortex. There's a cell body and there's all these dendrites, which are the branches, and there's connections on the branches between two other cells. Those are the synapses. I'm sure you've heard these terms before. Um, a typical neuron in the brain has anywhere from a few thousand to 50,000 uh, synapses on it. Thousands of synapses. By the way, if you've, anything you've ever heard about neural networks in the past, where they have like these neurons which only have like a few connections, forget it. It's nothing like real neurons. Real neurons are very complex things. Um, so if I zoom in one of those dendritic segments, and here's a picture of one of those dendritic segments, you can actually see the synapses on it. There's these little dots. I don't know if you can see it in the back of the room, I apologize. But on this little segment there, there's these little spines coming off, and they're called spines. And this is where the synapses are formed. Um, and they're about one micron apart along the length of the dendrite. Now, what we've learned in recent years, and in neuroscience, recent years is like 15 years. Uh, things go slower in neuroscience. We learned in the last 15 years or so is that um, when you have these synapses arranged along the dendrites, if, um, if a bunch of them come active at the same time close together, so like within a 40 micron distance, you have maybe 20 of these guys become active. Then, and they all come back within a few milliseconds of the other, then it's a very nonlinear effect. It generates a spike, which has a large effect on the cell body. If those spikes arrive at different timing or far apart, they don't have hardly any effect at all. So these, these, these dendritic segments are like coincidence detectors. They detect a coincident pattern of activity on 20 to 40 um, connections at the same time. And you've got lots of these dendritic segments. We model this in the following way. We, we, these are the pictures you're, you're going to see me using here. Uh, we're modeling a little segment of, the, uh, of a, a layer of a, a cortex with a bunch of cells. Here I'm showing a bunch of little cubes in a, in a, in a little stack, so it's a layer with a bunch of uh, columns. And there is a picture on our right is our artificial neuron, how we model the neurons. And the colored dots are the synapses. I'm not going to talk about the green ones today. I'm just going to talk about the blue ones. And those blue ones, what I was just talking about, those blue dots are connections to other cells that are arranged along a dendritic segment, and they act as coincidence detectors. So in this picture, you can see there's a little circle next to one of those lines of blue dots. 
That's showing you a little threshold detector, meaning once I get above a certain threshold, I have a nonlinear event. I OR those together. So the cell basically is looking at the OR of many of these coincidence detectors. And the cell essentially is going to go into a predictive state, you'll see in a moment, um, when, it, when it's detecting a pattern out there in the world on one of these, on one of these dendritic segments. So how are we going to turn this into sequence memory? So that's, this is the structure we have right now. And we want to answer the question, how does this learn sequences? So now I'm going to show you a different picture of our sparse distributed representation. Instead of showing you ones and zeros, I'm going to show you these little cubes. These are like cells in the brain, but you can think of them as ones and zeros. The red ones are the ones, the active ones, and the, and the gray ones are the zeros. This is not 2,000. This is about a quarter of that, just to show you what it looks like. So, but it's sparse. And at any point in time, I'll have some, I won't explain how this happens in this talk, but at any point in time, I have a pattern on these cells, which is a sparse distributed representation. At another point in time, I have a different pattern. This is happening very rapidly in your brain. Right now, this is going on in your head all over the place, uh, where you have these things going on and off like this. And what we want to do is we want to learn this sequence. Well, you have this sheet of cells, and all these cells are independent. What does it mean to learn a sequence? Each cell does it on its own. I'll show you how this works. So um, imagine this cell in the middle here, when it becomes on, you're one of these cells, when you become active, you become active from a feed-forward input, something in the world made you become active, what you do is you look for neighboring cells that were active just prior to you. They were active just a moment ago. And you want to form connections to them. And that's what's happening here. This, this cell in the middle that's yellow is saying, OK, I just became active. What was active prior to me? And I'm going to form connections to it. Um, and I'm showing that on the bottom right here, where we're basically forming connections in one of those dendrites. So we're basically saying, I'm looking for a coincidence of pattern. Now, I don't need to look at all the cells nearby me. I don't even have to be able to look at all the cells nearby me. I only have to look at enough of them, maybe 10 or 15 or 20. And if I make enough connections, then I'm good enough. And I'm, it's good as, as if I looked at all the cells nearby me. Um, so we actually want to form these connections. And if you do this, if every cell, at every time a cell becomes active, every time a bit becomes active, it looks around and forms connections to the neighbors who were previously active, then everyone is doing this all the time. And you'll get things like this. Here's a, here's a case where I have an input, which is the red cells. These are being driven by the feed forward input. And the yellow cells are all predictive. They're all saying, hey, I might be next. I might be next. Now, you can see there's more yellow cells than red cells. This is because, in this case, we train the, 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 the network on a, very, you know, a series of patterns, like A followed by B, and A followed by C, and A followed by D. So if I show it A, it's going to predict B, C, and D. So I have a multiple prediction going on. Um, this is the basis of sequence memory. You've basically learned a, a transition state from one to the other, and it's distributed. Now, the problem we have here is that this is first order, meaning there's no history here. I can't. Um, I couldn't learn a sequence A, B, A, C because the two A's would be confused and it would just, it, it, there's no history here. It's a first order uh, memory. We need a variable or high order memory uh, to, to make this work. So um, the way we're going to do that is we're going to use uh, columns. And uh, we'll just, I'm going to go back to my, um, my uh, drawings here with ones and zeros. So here's a sparse distributed representation. And instead of using just one cell for each bit, um, or I'm going to use 10 or something like that. I'm going to use a column. So here I've shown above each bit, I actually have 10 different cells. And this is a column of cells. And I'm going to pick one of those cells to represent, uh, randomly for starts, to, be, uh, to represent this. So I've done this, and, and now, I've, now I have a different representation. I'm going to show the exact same sparse distributed representation, but I'm going to pick a different set of cells in each column. So in each column, I randomly pick a 1 of 10. So 9 out of 10 of these things will be different on each one. So if you look at the, if I think of all those circles as cells, each one, I have a lot of cells now. I have 10 times 2,000. I have 20,000. Um, but I now have 40 cells active in there. And they're very different. And I'm representing this, the same input in two different ways. You can easily think about this. If I have 40 active columns, I have 10 cells per column. I have 10 to the 40th ways of representing the same input. And this is the ability to do, learn very long and complex sequences because I can repeating elements over and over again and never get confused. If I say, for example, the sentence, um, uh, there are too many two twos to count, uh, I use the sound two four times in that sentence. Um, and hopefully, you, you didn't confuse them. You didn't get lost to what I was talking about. That's because each time I said the word two, at one point in your brain, at the columnar level, it was representing the same pattern. But at the cellular level, it was representing it differently each time in sequence. OK, so that's the basis of this. And when you put this all together, and I'm not going to walk you through all the details. There's some details to this that uh, make this work and deal with all the edge cases and so on. Um, but what you do when you, when you build something like this, at any point in time, you have a you have a bunch of cells that are being predicted, a bunch of cells that are being driven by feed forward pointer, and you're essentially in a state which is a high order state of, of, of the sequences in the world. 
And you have to trust me on this, as this is a very interesting way of building a sequence memory. Um, it is variable order, it's, uh, it's distributed, meaning you notice that there's no single place I store the sequences. There's no single location, it's, it's distributed. All the elements are, are doing their own thing. Um, it's making multiple simultaneous predictions. It's a very high capacity memory. Uh, the kind of memories you build can learn mi millions and millions of transitions quite easily without getting confused. And it has some other really, really cool properties such as semantic generalization. Meaning if I learned a set of patterns uh, using one, if I, if I had a bunch of patterns coming in and I learned sequences of them, if I now have new patterns come in that are semantically similar but different, semantically similar, I can apply the previous patterns, the previous um, sequences to it. It'll say, hey, yeah, this is different, but it's similar. I'm going to learn my previous knowledge about transitions and about uh, pooling and things like that. To, and, and it basically allows the system to generalize semantically, uh, which is really what we need in brains and intelligent machines. OK, uh, I'm going to briefly, I was debating whether to cover this today, so this is the, the, the farthest reaches of my talk here. Um, I was going to talk about requirements for online learning. Uh, we have to, this system has to be online. You know, there's no batch processing in the brain, right? You don't, you don't um, you know, store up today's patterns and stick it in a file someplace and then process it tonight. You have to handle it as you go. Uh, you don't get a chance to go back and look at it. So it's an online learning system. And the problem with online learning systems is it's continually learning, but you know, new patterns might be noise or they might be something important. So you don't really know. So you have to learn on everything. But you don't want to remember the noise parts. You only want to remember the things that occur again and again. So basically, when you do online learning, if a you have to learn all the time. But if a pattern doesn't repeat, you forget it. If a pattern does repeat, you reinforce it. Um, this is done in neuroscience and in our models in the following way. Um, you may, you may, let's go back to our little picture here of the, of, the, of the neurons. And going all the way over to the right, we have those synapses on the dendritic spine. Now, for many years, um, for 60 years now, people thought about neurons and learning as the, the strengthening of connections between cells, the strengthening of synapses. And certainly that's happening. But we now know that synapses form rapidly, de novo, from like I have an axon and a dendrite and there's no synapses and in a matter of seconds it can grow one. And so it's actually better to think about synapses as being formed and unformed than strengthening and weakening. And that's how we model it. Um, and the way we do this is the following. We basically say synapses are binary. They're either connected or they're not connected, but they have a growth, a permanence, which is sort of representing how far they've grown and how, 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 what their state of, of permanence is. And that's a scalar. So we have the scalar thing that from zero to one, and if it's above a threshold, like, then we say it's connected, and if it's below the threshold, we say it's not connected. This allows me to say I can start learning on something and incrementing its permanence before it has any effect on the system. It doesn't have any practical effect because it's below the threshold. And it says once I've made a connection, if I repeat these patterns over and over again, I can make it really permanent so it's hard to forget. And so we, we needed to add that to that. If you add all this up, just to give you a sense of what this is like, um, one of our systems, we typically, uh, we're only we're modeling a small region in the neocortex. We have 2,000 columns, 30 cells per column, 128 uh, uh, dendritic uh, segments per cell, and about 40 connections per segment. Those are all biologically realistic numbers, at least the, the last three there are. And so you can end up, you just do the math, it's about 300 million connections um, in one of our models. These connections are very sparse. Um, and therefore, you know, we don't have to save all this stuff. There's tricks we can do uh, to make the, the memory requirements much smaller. Uh, again, there are no single points of failure in the system. You can drop out connections, you can drop out dendrites, you can drop out cells, you can drop out columns. It's very, everything can degrade very gracefully, uh, just like in the brain. Okay, now, I'm time to switch topics completely. I'm now going to show you this working in a real system. And to do that, I have to, um, introduce the field of which we're working at Numenta, uh, beyond the neuroscience stuff. So uh, we're doing the world in predictive analytics or uh, streaming data, and so I need to give you a little background on our philosophy about this. So here's the way the world looks today. Um, we have lots of sensory data in the world, and we collect it and put it in databases. Uh, and then we can go back and look at it. We have tools for doing visualization on those databases, and we have tools for making uh, predictive models, and there's a whole bunch of companies doing products in this field. Uh, and the problem with this is that the data is too fast, the data is too big, there are not enough people. Um, so we have these several problems. There's the data prep problem, but the models get obsolete very quickly. You know, in the real world, we have high velocity data, and the patterns in the data are constantly changing. So the time you get your models done, it's, 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 they're, they're invalid anymore, and they, you have to go and redo them again. And, and basically, the biggest problem is there's not enough people who can do this work. Um, we're of the belief, and I'm certain of this, that the, uh, a large part of the future of data is going to be the following. 
you're going to take data from sensors, you're going to stream them directly to, to online models, and those online models are going to go read directly to actions. Uh, and, and this is, it's, we're going to automate the entire process. Of course, this may sim look similar to what brains do, and that's how we got into this space. When I started the Mentem, we was all about doing the theory and the brain stuff. We didn't really think about this, but we said, okay, what are we going to do with this? We said, this is a good place to apply these models. So the key criteria to do this kind of streaming data is you need to have automated model creation, you have to have continuous learning because the patterns in the world change, and you have to be able to find temporal and spatial patterns in the data. It's not good enough just to find spatial correlations, you have to look for the time sequences uh, and patterns in the data. So that's what we've done. Um, we've created this product called Grok, which is an engine for acting on data streams. Here is a, a conceptual diagram how it works. On the left, we have a stream of records coming in. I show three records there, one or more fields. Those fields are some of structured or semi-structured data, numbers, categories, and so on. We run them through a set of encoders, which are like your retina and so on. We turn them into sparse distributed representations. Um, I'll tell you a second about that. We then take those sparse distributed representations, we run them through our cortical learning algorithm, the, the memory model I just showed you. We get predictions out the other side. We turn those predictions into actions. And then you have a system that basically learns continuously on streams of data. Um, I won't go into total detail, but I know that some of you will be interested, like how do we encode these fields into sparse distributed representations? Let me give you a brief introduction. Imagine I had a, a number, um, a scalar or, or floating point number, something like that. And I, you can imagine a number line. And I say, okay, I'm, this is oil temperature, or this is energy, or pricing, or something like that. And I want to turn it into a sparse distributed representation. Imagine this number goes from 0 to 100. And now imagine I, I define some buckets. One bucket's from zero to, uh, one to, uh, 0 to 10, the other's from 1 to 11, and the other's from 2 to 12, and so on. And so I have all these overlapping buckets. Each is associated with a bit. So if I pick a number on the number line, I'll get 10 activations, I'll 10 one bits representing 10 things that are sort of shifted buckets that overlap that one number. So if I pick 20, the, the number from 19 to, to 29 will be active, and 18 to 28 will be active, and so on. So I have a long number line. I have a bunch of ones, so it's, it's a sparse representation. And notice that when the number increases, if I go from 20 to 21 to 22 as the input, one bit drops off and another bit at, comes on. So there's, a, there's semantic similarity between 19 and 20 because I share a lot of bits, but they're slightly different. And that's the kind of thing we want to do. Anyway, we've come up with a set of encoders to do this automatically so you don't have to think about it. Um, well, as a user of Grok, all you have to do is you have to provide the data streams um, to us. You have to define your problem. What do I want to predict? How far in advance? How often? Um, et cetera. Then Grok does a lot of stuff I'm not going to tell you about here, uh, but essentially it, it does a, a parameter search to figure out the best way of representing those inputs. It creates models for you. It learns continuously, so you just start streaming the data to it. And then um, it finds the patterns in the data if it can, and then it outputs predictions with probabilities, saying, okay, it's 30% chance of this and 20% chance of that type of thing. And then we act upon it. There's a lot of um, uh, interesting customer areas we're finding, a lot in the energy space, energy pricing, demand response, um, product forecasting, and network returns, machine efficiencies, server loads. I'll give you a couple of examples of this to see how this stuff works. Uh, just in case you're interested, I'm, I'm not the software guy here. Uh, but our basic architecture running today on an Amazon um, cloud, uh, we have a REST API, people write apps to it. There's a few, uh, few apps, web apps is a, a quick starting thing, and there's a developer dashboard. Uh, we use some, some of the modern tools, uh, Hadoop, but we don't use it for our data. We use it for managing processes and jobs. Um, anyway, you don't need to know this, and, and Grok doesn't have to be running on a cloud service. It could be running uh, on a dedicated machine, too. Uh, I'll just give you an example in the energy space, demand response. In case you don't know what demand response is, it turns out that in large energy consumers are constantly bidding on the price of their electricity or energy. And they can do this on an hourly basis and a daily basis, being if I'll use this much at this price, there's these markets that are going out there. And if people can predict their energy usage better, uh, they can save a lot of money. Uh, so it's something. Now I'm going to show you a very simple example here so you can see it, uh, although not all the examples are so clean and simple like this. Here's energy usage in a building um, for seven days. And you can see there's five days and then there's a weekend where not much is going on in, that, in this particular building. And there's some pattern to this. Um, now we feed this to Grok, and in, the, in this case, particular case, the customer wanted to predict, you know, uh, well, I'll tell you in a moment. The customer wanted to predict, uh, at midnight, wanted to predict hourly what the co energy consumption is going to be for the following day. So 24 predictions in a row. Uh, and so when I show you the next chart, this is what it'll be doing. Uh, let's see here. So here it is now, we're laying the, the, the real versus the prediction, the reds is the prediction, the blue is, the, is reality. Now, I'll, I'll warn you, you can't really tell too much by looking at like a chart like this. So I'm not like claiming, hey, isn't that great? It is that great, actually, the customer's very happy. But, um, but, 
But you, you have to be very careful when you're trying to, you know, to judge how well something is doing. But in this case, you get a sense that Grok is picking up these patterns. It's learning it uh, very quickly. It starts saying, hey, there's these patterns I see, and then it looks like this, and it looks like this. Uh, and if those patterns change, it quickly adapts and say, well, the, the new, new reality is something different. Um, here's an interesting case where we went three days into a week, and then there was a holiday that which we didn't know about or no one knew. Well, we wasn't trained on the system, and so the, it, on the beginning of the fourth day, Grok starts saying, "Hey, it's, energy is supposed to start going up," and then it says, "No, it didn't go up." It says, "Oh, maybe it's a different pattern. It's like it's like it's predicting a melody, and then a new melody comes along and says, "Oh, I guess I was wrong. It's the new melody," and so it basically falls into a different pattern where it's predicting the, the rest of the week like that. So it can adjust very rapidly in situations like that. Um, let me give you a, another example. This is a customer who is uh, doing video transcoding, and they have uh, customers send them videos, and they have to transcode them in real time and put them up on the web immediately. And they have, a, and because they have to do this very rapid, they have to have a lot of servers online all the time. Most of the time, they're just sitting there doing nothing. And if they could be, they have to have this extra buffer. If they could predict the demand from their customers better, then they could save a lot of money by uh, not having so many servers sitting around. So uh, we, this is another situation where blue is actual, red is predicted. As a, this is a much messier pattern. You can't always get this stuff right. Rock can't always predict it. But the point is, can you do better than any other system? In this case, we could. And we did a, it looked like we could reduce our cost by about 15% uh, on something like this. Um, now I'm going to walk you through sort of internals, just a little bit of internals, to show you what to look. Just look at the thing on the right here. Don't pay attention to the stuff on the left. It's just more predictions than actuals. On the right, we're looking at an internal sort of tool we have where the, each of those little dots or circles is, there's 2,000 of them, uh, and that's one of our, the, the columns in our models. And the green dots are ones that were predicted and actually occurred. So this is a prediction. We had a single prediction of 40 green, 40 columns, 40 bits, and, um, and they actually occurred. It was a single prediction and, a single, and it was a perfect match. That happens actually more than you think. Here's another example where um, we actually had multiple predictions going on. So the blue circles are, I'm not sure if they look blue to you, um, but the blue circles are ones that were also predicted but didn't occur. So this is one we predicted multiple things. The green ones, what did occur, this is a perfectly good match because one of the things we predicted occurred at this point in time. And then here's one that's sort of a mixed bag, and it doesn't look like you can see the reds in that. Well, there's some reds, there's a bunch of red circles on that one. Um, and what's going on here is that some of the, some of the columns were predicted, and occurred, some of the predicted and it didn't occur, and some things occurred which weren't predicted. And those were anomalies. Those were things that were unexpected. And there's maybe about 25 or so of those red circles on there. Um, and what that means is that what the point of this is to show that you know, prediction is not a binary thing. It's like, oh, here's the answer. It's a very subtle thing, and even anomalies are subtle things. I can look at this and say, well, part of it was right and part of it was wrong. I can say, even ask what parts were wrong and by what degree and so on, and what was the semantic meaning of the wrongness. Um, and so there's a lot of subtlety that can be, can be picked out of these internal representations. Here's an example where we're using the anomalies. This is uh, looking at uh, bearing engine oil temperature, oil temperature in a crank case of a big windmill. Okay, and the blue line is the temperature fluctuating in this windmill crank case. These are very expensive big windmills offshore. And, uh, and then the, bottom, the red line on the bottom here is basically this, uh, sort of a, a, an average, a running average of the anomaly of, of the temporal patterns. Now, what's interesting about this is you can see, um, do I have a, yeah, on the, under the circle there, you can see there's a peak, and there's a couple of peaks in the red, which is our anomaly score. And this occurred not because the oil temperature got out of range. It didn't get out of range. It's just that the temporal patterns looked unusual. It was like I'm listening to a bunch of melodies. I'm, I'm now I'm saying notes, but the, the order of them was wrong. And so Grok said, this doesn't look normal. I haven't seen this before. And so the anomaly score goes up. And that turned out to correspond to uh, an event of interest to the, to the windmill manufacturer. OK, uh, so now I'm going to end my talk. I, don't, I have no idea what time it is here. How am I doing on time? I got 10 minutes. Oh, good. Well, then I can, I can wax eloquently. What's that? You're going to keep listening no matter what. You're going to keep listening no matter what. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to run out of things to say after a while. So, um, But let me talk about, I'm just talking about the future of machine intelligence. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm excited about the future of machine intelligence. I think it's going to be just amazing. Um, and, and people have different opinions about this. I mean, um, and I have a very, a very unique opinion about it. Uh, I'm not trying to just a lot of other things. Like I think, you know, um, I, I want to drive a Google self-driving car, and I'm thrilled that IBM can beat Watson. I mean, they can beat Jeopardy and play chess and all this kind of stuff. But I'm interested in building machines that work on the way the brain works. And I think there's going to be many, many things that um, can be done this way that we can't do otherwise. And it's going to be very difficult to know 
um, how this is all going to play out, but I believe that the future machine intelligence is going to be based on these principles I was just talking to you about. Uh, and I believe if you take other approaches, you can do interesting things, but it won't really be the core of, of intelligence. So let's, let's just speculate a bit. I, I hate talking about the future because we never really know what's going to happen. Um, but but um, there's some things I can say right up front. There's a lot more theory that has to be done here, a lot more science. So there's a lot of stuff I didn't tell you about, which we, some of which we know in, somewhat in depth, some of which we know very little about. There's a lot of other problems, interesting um, neuroscience and, and, and information theory problems. I, there's some questions we still have about how the hierarchy works. We did some experimentation on that. Um, there's this whole issue of sensory motor integration. It turns out every region in the neocortex has a motor output. There isn't a motor output section of your brain. People used to think that way. We now know that every part of your neocortex has a motor output, even the low-level visual parts. And so this idea of how the, how the brain not only perceives and in, in, infers and make predictions, but is also generating motor behavior at the exact same time, there's all these really interesting clues to how this works, but I don't understand it yet, and no one does. Um, there's a whole issue about attention. So the point is that there's more science that has to be done here, um, and it's fun to do. The, um, the next thing is we can talk about what's the embodiment of these systems. You know, today we're doing this on a simple system, it's a cloud-based service. Obviously it could be embedded. Um, uh, one interesting idea is, you know, the brain has a hierarchy of memory regions that are all in your head, right? That's where they all are, they're on one sheet of cells. But there's no reason they have to be in one location. And we start thinking about the arrays of sensors in the world. There's billions and billions, there'll be trillions of sensors in the world, and they're distributed around the world. So it's possible we might build distributed hierarchies. That is, I can have, you can imagine I'll have um, models of buildings and cities over here, and models of buildings and cities over here, and then they combine in some other hierarchical way someplace else. And so the idea that you could do very clever things with hierarchies and, um, and extracting sort of uber patterns um, is, is very interesting, and I really have no idea how it's going to play out. But I have a feeling it's going to be important. Um, there's clearly a need to build hardware here. We're doing this in software, and we spend a lot of time doing tricks in software to make this fast. We have to make this fast. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're modeling large systems of 60,000 neurons and millions of connections. And, um, but, it, you know, there's a limit to what we can do here. And so for the usual reasons of speed, cost, and power, we really want to do custom hardware on this. Uh, and I've already had several conversations with some uh, major hardware companies who are, who are on the experimentation, the research side, are looking at this, are very interested in our algorithms. Um, and if you think about it, though, what we're trying to do here is not like new computers, it's, it's memory. This is all memory. So it's new memory architectures. Um, now, one thing that's interesting in, in, uh, in this case, is everything is fault tolerant. There's, you know, you can lose bits, you can lose columns, you can lose anything, you know, essentially, the system degrades gracefully, so the whole dynamics of how you go about designing com uh, memory chips could change. Well, today, it's very much on you know, keeping the limit on how many, you, know, you can't have more than just a few defects on any chip. Well, now what if I could say you can have 1% of your memory cells be defective? What would that mean in terms of your process and so on? That's very interesting to think about. Of course, a large part of the problem building um, intelligent machines and building a brain is interconnection. Most of the, your brain is connections, the whole white mitres connections. In fact, everywhere you look, it's mostly connections. It's, it's, it's uh, neurons connecting being axons and dendrites. So these don't work very well for chips. Chips aren't really good at massive connections. Um, so there's a lot of problems to be solved there. And um, again, sparsity can come to our, our, our aid because we don't have to connect everything to everything. We might say, hey, it's good enough, I only, I'm only able to connect the, the half the bits, or I'm only able to make a connection to something. Um, and we can do the subsampling and hierarchy. So there's, there's a whole series of things here which might get us to rethink what it means to build memory chips uh, and to build computer chips in general. And then finally, what are the applications that, that are going to be done with this? Um, well. Um, you know, today I showed you an example of our first product. It's a prediction anomaly detection streaming data engine called Grok. Um, that's pretty cool, but it's just a bit of iceberg. There's, a, there's what I call the classics, the classics of AI. So most people come to me and say, oh, wow, we'll be able to do vision and language and speech and so on. And you probably, yeah, the brain does all that stuff, but I actually don't think this is where it's going to be interesting. Um, these, to me, are problems that can be probably solved other ways, and, and they're not maybe even that interesting. I think we, the history of technology has shown us over and over and over again that the really cool applications that come along are not the ones we anticipated at the time. And I, I think that's going to happen here as well. So what are those cool applications? What are the really big wins? 
Um, well, I've already told you, I don't know, but I can tell you a few things. I can tell you we can make, we can make artificial brains, if you want to call it that way, or, or machines that work on the principles of the neocortex. We can make them that run a million times faster than brains. You know, brains are pretty slow. Uh, neurons can't do anything faster than about five milliseconds, and that's pushing it. Um, so, you know, brains are pretty slow. And what if we can make them things run a million or 10 million or 100 million times faster? Um, wow, and not get tired. That's pretty interesting. We can make them bigger. We can make memory systems that are much, much larger than, uh, than the human brain. Um, and, um, and we can also come up with all kinds of creative sensory arrays that we didn't have before, things that can sense things that are very small and very large. To me, the goal here is not to build anything like a robot. It's not to build human-like things. It's not to pass the Turing test. I have no interest in that whatsoever. I want to build machines that are useful for humans. And I, if I think about, you know, um, you know what, I, what excites me in the world is, is knowledge discovery. I love learning new things. And uh, I imagine most of you do too. So the idea that we can have tools that help us learn new things, like having really, really smart physicists who work around the clock a million times faster and never get tired and never have to eat, um, that would be pretty cool, you know? And, and they, they have no human desires. There's no point. You know, these are things that are like sentient beings are going to take over the world or anything like that. It's just, these are just tools for us. Um, and if I want to explore the universe, I don't think humans are going to do that. We're not designed for that. But we could build machines, robotic machines that are intelligent, can, can really figure out the world, and we can send them out then to come back and tell us what's going on out there. So um, to me, it's like these are the kind of weird things that could happen. Uh, and I'm very, very excited about it. I'm sure it'll be very interesting, and I hope I get live long enough to see some of it occur. Um, so what do you want to learn more information about this? Well, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, one, on our website, there's a white paper which talks about this, uh, what we call the cortical learning algorithm, which is more details about the algorithm I just told you about. It doesn't tell you the internals of Grok, but it tells you the algorithm. You can read that. Um, you can read my book, which Alex mentioned, on intelligence. It's about five years old now, so it covers sort of the big picture. It doesn't cover the details of the learning algorithm which we didn't understand at that time. Um, this talk I'm, gonna gi I'm giving right now is going to be posted by Alex, but you can see a very similar talk I gave at the International Symposium of Computer Architecture back in July, I think it was. It's on the, it's on, uh, on the web, on our website, or on YouTube. You can just look for Jeff Hawkins ISCA. Um, I'm here for the rest of the day. I also have two people with me, Joe Hayashi, who's our VP of Marketing, and Matt Taylor, who's our uh, Manager of Web uh, Services at, at, uh, at Numenta. Matt's an old-time uh, Strange Loop guy, an old St. Louis, Louisian, Louisian? St. Louisian. Um, so we're going to be hanging out here all day. We actually, actually have a room over in the hotel, some room over there, where, we're, where we give demos if you want to come over there. It's the Zephyr Rocket Room. And we can tell you what Grok's about and tell you more in, in details about it. And, um, and there's my email address. You're welcome to send me emails about anything. I respond to all emails. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. The question, does the system learn like a child becoming more expert over time? Yes, it does. I mean, it's a learning system. So it, it starts with a memory structure, but really there's no, nothing in it. <laughs> um, and, and then as you stream the data in, it starts learning these patterns. And it has a very high capacity. So it starts adding and adding and adding on top of it. Um, we're, we're, we're not like a human, I, I, you know, we only model this very, really small part of the neocortex, one little layer, one little thing, it's very small. But, um, but in, a, in a human, there's a hierarchy and there's a whole bunch of learning processes that occur over the hierarchy. So like if you learn to play piano and you practice over and over again, it actually the, you, you, you start at the higher up the hierarchy and move it down. So there's a bunch of other things that humans do when we learn we're not doing that. But basically it's a learning system and basically there's no program, the program is just modeling the memory, you stream data in, and it starts learning the patterns. And it will forget, too. Um, if you don't see a pattern in a long time, there, as it fills up, it sort of forgets the things that you haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, I'll take this question right front, yeah. So the question is, a lot of the, a lot of the technologies discussed here uh, have community groups, that, and they have various ways of getting together and forums and so on. Uh, do we have anything like this? Um, that's a great question for Matt and Joe, I think, later. Um, you know, we'd love to do that. We have, right now we're in a private beta, and this is very difficult stuff to get running. It's still difficult to get running. Um, we didn't feel like this leashing it on everyone. It's very hard to understand what the hell's going on inside of all this stuff. So we want to move in more of a, a, an open direction, but right at the moment we're, we're in a private beta and the code is not available to other people. Um, there are people out there, by the way, in the white paper, there's pseudocode for the algorithms, and we've had several independent implementations of this. Uh, around the world, um, but I don't know if there's any, there's not at the moment much organized activity. I'm looking for 
Matt to say yes or no. No, maybe not. Uh, I, we'd love to have it. Well, come and talk to us more about it. Uh, it's, we, we're trying to match the reality of a startup company that has to make a, have to make a profit at some point in time. We've been going along for a long time without making a profit. So um, we're trying to you know, get to the point where we're a stable business, and then, um, then we can spend more time in that sort of community aspect. But you know, one of my personal goals is to be a catalyst for machine intelligence. Um, meaning, I, I don't, I'm not interested in just building a business, I'm interested in, I'm doing this because I want people, I want opportunities like this to speak to people like you. And I'm, I'm doing this because I'm not trying to sell a product, I'm trying to get other people excited about this. Um, and it's a very big, challenging task, it takes quite a while to really understand deeply all the things I'm talking about here. It's going to be very many years that this is going to play out, this is not a very short term thing. So um, yes, it's, it's the ultimate goal is to really build a very, very large community of people working on this. Uh, and I'm just going about it in the best way I can, which is uh, piecemeal, and, and it's very, very small right now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to take, take a few more. I see this gentleman first here. <laughs> the question is, how sparse do things have to be before it turns all yellow? Um, uh, you know, what's, what's, we've done a lot of experimentation on sparsity, right? Uh, trying to figure how sparse things have to be. There's a trade-off. Um, in general, you, you want to have enough bits active that you have a distributed representation so that if you only had one bit active, you'd have what they call a grandmother cell and the system wouldn't be reliable. You want to have enough bits active and yet um, you don't want to be, you want to be very sparse because there's, there's advantages come from being very sparse and there's advantages coming to have enough bits active. And that's why you have to have very large representations. Um, we've done experiments trying to run our systems down to as little as 500 columns versus 2,000 columns, and that's sort of borderline. Things start falling apart. You really can't, you can't, you can't have enough bits active and be sparse enough. Um, so um, you can make, so we, you can be anywhere in the in the five percent to one percent of your cells active, but you have to have a certain number of cells active, otherwise you can't do the the, the subsampling and so on. Um, the question about the number of yellow bits is like, how you don't want to predict too many things. If I if I predicted everything, then all the uh, all the cells become predictive. Um, in the in the brain, there's a lot of uh, in inhibitory functions. I didn't talk about it. All this stuff is is based on these inhibitory neurons, which basically keep things at certain levels. So what'll happen in the brain is everybody's trying to predict all at once, but the inhibition just basically shuts it off at some percentage. Um, so all the cells are going to be trying to predict at some level, but the inhibition just lets the, the top predictors go. So you don't have to worry about the system um, predicting too many things, if you will. Uh, we can adjust that very easily. You can just, you, the brain, just by, you can just dial it up and down. Um, by the way, just a little side if you're following all this. Uh, what I imagine is happening when you, when you look at like a, a cloud and someone says, what do you see in that cloud? And, and you look up at the cloud and you say, I see a cloud. And they say, oh, don't you see an animal? Well, what I think is happening there is that you're not really having, those, those, there's not enough of those predictions occurring. You don't have enough yellow bits, if you will. Um, and you're lowering the threshold saying, oh, I'll just keep lowering the threshold until something pops out. Um, and, and then you go, oh, there's a dog. I really think that's exactly what's happening when, you do, when you're looking at something like that. All right, I'm gonna take, we're gonna be around, so I'm gonna take one more question. I'm gonna take the person in the back there, in the back back, yeah. Yeah, I think the question is, um, it, this, this seems there might be a fair amount of undeterministic uh, behaviors in this system, and have we learned anything interesting about that? Um, well, um, well, it is determinist. There's a, there's a bunch of random processes, and if you give it the same random seeds and the same data and exactly the same thing, it'll actually generally, oh, well, actually, not anymore, because I think the, the crazy stuff on the, the Hadoop and all that stuff gets it all messed up. The scheduling gets it. <laughs> So, in theory, it's deterministic. Um, in practicality, it's not, okay? And uh, we do have random seeds, which vary, but we also have the way we, 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 we spread this on a bunch of processes and so on. You end up, you never really, you know, practically, it's not deterministic. Um, so this is worrisome because you run the same experiments twice. You sometimes get slightly different errors. It makes it very difficult to de debug. Uh, it's, very, it's very, very difficult in systems like this to know how well it's doing. You know, is, it, is that a good prediction or not prediction? What's your ground truth and how do you even judge it? And most, even labeled data doesn't have the kind of data we typically really want. Um, so um, this, you're, you're touching on a, an area which makes it very difficult to work on these systems. I don't think we've learned anything uh, dramatic other than it makes it difficult to work on these systems. Um, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but there's no, no amazing insights that come out of this thing. Obviously, when you get to something that is sufficient, it's interesting, you know, because this is very interesting. I'll end on this interesting philosophical thought that, you know, in theory, it should be deterministic. There's, the, the, the way we're doing this here, it's this code is running. It's, but in, in, in a real brain, of course, there's so much going on. Uh, the cells are random. They're, they're stochastic. Um, there's all kinds of weird crap happening in your brain. There's no way in the world it's deterministic. And, and so you're basically looking for attractors, and, and that's... But even in our first implementation, our simple implementation in Grok, it is no longer deterministic because of this, the complexity is the way we've implemented it on the web. Um, and uh, that makes it, it... Already we've lost the determinism in the whole thing. Um, and I think that's never... We're never going to turn around and go back. But um, I don't think we've learned anything deeper than that. Um, anyway, again, the three of us are going to be around today, and uh, we'll be hanging out in the lobby here for, for a little while. Then you can come by the room over in the other hotel any time in, into the evening, I guess. I don't know how late we'll be there. To seven. Um, and you can chat with us more. Again, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>